Well, we're waiting for some of the people who aren't here yet to come in. I think I will be reading to you something which is not a part of the story itself, but it is, the name of it is, The Why, The Wherefore, and The How Come. And I will try to approximate the, the way people talk in Maine. <laughs> Of course, all you have to do is row over and smell it all, and eat apple and roll, look at it in And you won't necessarily hear that language over there, <laughs> because it's contaminated. So in some cases, by people from Hampshire and Massachusetts, even more. Well, my friends, this is the why, the for, and the how come. And it is not technically a part of the story itself, but it is instruction. Like many other stories that have appeared from time to time, I didn't really write this one. It would be an untruth to wish that I had because I don't wish any such a thing. This is true folk material, and its authors must, recover, must remain forever unknown. Too many people have cast it on down, adding as it came. I have added one word myself, line 224, and I'm pleased with the improvement. I don't know of my own knowledge if this story has ever been written down before. It's been around for a long time and may have, but it has taken its form orally and I have here recorded it as numerous main storytellers give it. So to wish I had written it is to wish away its charm. Just as we would spoil the old Scottish ballads by learning suddenly that they had really been written by Mrs. Eleanor Rosa. <laughs> I think you will agree with me. The ending of this tale may startle elderly librarians and sensitive folks who have not been extensively exposed to the facts of life. But I make no apology for it. I tell it the way I hear it. I merely point out that dogs will be dogs. I do call the reader's attention to copious and scholarly notes in the back of the book, where a number of academic matters are treated with penetrating analysis and self scholarship. I suggest the story be taken at one sitting, and the notes saved for later. Do not, as some students do, interrupt the flow of the discourse by turning it on moments to the appendix. The story belongs to the times when people sat around. <laughs> Before radio, television, and open-air movies. It offers entertainment over a period of time and thus differs from the quick gag of the modern breed. It is in the tradition of the one-eyed minstrel and wandering troubadour. Ulysses had his Argos, Llewellyn his Geller, and here is a new background up in Maine. It's a story that should be told, not read, but if read, it should be read aloud. <coughs> It should be also pronounced after the main fashion. For instance, fastest should be pronounced fastest throughout. <laughs> Dialect is hard to read, and I have not tried to spell main speech. Besides, dialect is a matter of sound and not of orthography. So if you ask a Vermont how to spell cow, he will probably say C-O-W. So I've skipped the alphabet from gymnastics, the so-called dialect. But I feel, I doubt that non-main accents will add much to the yard. Apart from the admitted purpose of monetary gain, the author and artist will move to production because we feel the story merits a permanent place in American literature, along with others whose places are already secured. I might mention the jumping frog, the Treasures Report, the 
devil and the devil Daniel Webster, and perhaps the old yarn of the New York trolley car that got lost. Or I might mention the ballad of Chevy Chase to go back before our own time. I think this story deserves study in schools and colleges where prospective writers could learn a lot from its craftsmanship. John Gould, Elizabeth Falls, Maine, 1953. In a note that precedes the main body of this reading, uh, there is this note. Widow Fitlock and Madame Wong Kay are announced especially, essentially, as written. Widow Fitlock and Madame Wong Kay. Thus, Wit O Pit Lock and Matt a Warm King. Principal stress on the penouts. Both these places exist, but readers are referred to the notes for the explanation of how they have to figure in this story. Here we go. I've heard many times. People have asked me how I come to own the fastest hound dog in the state of Maine and why he was known to be the fastest. And I want to tell it just the way it happened so you know all the facts. I came from Widow Pitlock where I was living at the time down to Matawan K on the Bangor and the Rooster Railroad. <coughs> to buy myself a hound dog. Up to Wood Pitlock, we was having a run on long-legged rabbits then. And I didn't want one of these shock-legged dogs that can run all day and not move any. I wanted one with rangy pins that could get close enough to a Wood Pitlock rabbit so he'd exert himself and know he was chased. The shot like a dog we've been using was no good at all, and I says to myself, the hell with that. So, I set out on purpose to find me a dog that was high posted, limber and lickety, clever and able. And why I come down with Madawong Cake, I don't quickly know, but uh, I put cuss on dogs and have a sense of smelling them out once I know what I want. So here I was in Matawong Keg, not knowing a soul there. But I wandered around thinking if they had a likely dog in those parts, I'd soon find out. And if they weren't, I'd soon know that too, and know how I'm done. Well, I circulated some, and I had made up my mind as the day had gone away. And I started back to the depot, meaning to pick up a copy of the Bangor Daily News to read on the train going home. And to get there quicker, I cut across and come up onto the back end of the bar. And when I did, I had this premonition of dog. And I says to myself that I'd been led to this bar by some power unknown. So I said to myself, dog. <laughs> and just as I did, they commenced to bark. And I'd say offhand without exaggeration that the barn had 50 dogs in it. At least 50. <coughs> just then a little dog, a little door opened and a fellow stuck his head out and wanted to know what I was up to. I said I was just cutting across with the back door in the rustic depot. I moved up closer while I was saying it. When I got close enough to holler about the dogs, I said, what you got in there? In where, he says. <laughs> in that barn, I says. In what barn? I can see we weren't getting any place that way. And where I didn't have much time for the train, I says, sounds like dogs. It might be, he says. <laughs> I says, I'm looking for a dog if I try the one I want. Mine ain't for sale, he says. So I says, all right, but while I had a few minutes to train time, would you mind if I looked at them? He said, he didn't see no harm in that, so I did. 
Well, sir, I never see such a belly of dog. He had every kind of dog the mind of God had ever devised. Some nobody had thought of yet. And on top of that, he had crossed them up somewhat. But they were all fat and nice and all glad to see them. <coughs> I patted some of them and made of them and kept looking for one that might match up with a widow pit like a rabbit. But I didn't see any that took my fancy and I got to thinking I'd better be getting on down to the depot. But something <coughs> made me dilly-dally. No doubt it was Providence. And all at once over in a far corner, I heard a new bark. Some dog that hadn't been saying anything was started in. And for some reason, I liked the sound of it. So I says, uh, what's that? Yeah. <coughs> what's what, he says. That barking, I says. Dog, I guess, he says. So I went over. And he had a piece of chicken wire strung kitty cornered, and where it was back from the window, I couldn't quite see, but I, I run my hands in, and I got the friendliest lapping I ever had from a dog. And I knew right off that I'd come onto the very dog I was after, and no doubt about it. I could tell from the way he lapped that he had a kind heart and a knowing eye, and his bark was the bark of a hound. And where I held my hand, he'd come up to about, uh, about uh, oh, he'd come up about, about belt high or so. I made up my mind to have him first and look him over afterward. I was that sure. So I took my hand out and I said, sir, that might be the very dog I want. He ain't for sale, the fellow says. I says, I, I take it he's a hound. Uh, solid, he says. But he ain't for sale. I says, probably ain't much of a dog then. Oh yes, he says, he's a good dog, but I'm sentimental over him and I don't plan to let him go. So looking at my watch, I says, time's running on. And I got a train to catch. And I gotta be getting along. I says, if this dog was for sale, which you say he ain't, and you was to take a liking to me, knowing I could give him a good home, I says, what price would you put on him? Mm -hmm. He ain't for sale, he said. <laughs> I know that, I says, and I'm not interested in him. <laughs> but if I was to be interested in him, and you was to offer for sale, what kind of value would you set on him? Uh, I don't know, he says, I ain't thought of selling them and ain't put my mind to it. So I said, that's true, and I appreciate your feelings. <laughs> but what I'm talking is purely supposing if. And if I give you my word, I do give you my word, I ain't got the slightest anchors for that dog at all. And if you were to offer him to me as an outright present, I doubt you can make me take him, I says. So what I mean is my way of passing the time until the train comes. And I'd like to have your opinion as to what a dog like that is worth, so I'd know what to offer if I ever run up against one like him that takes my eye. <laughs> well, he says, putting it that way, I gotta tell you that he's really a valuable dog. I said, that's an opinion. And I respect your right to hold it. <laughs> But I was hoping to express it in terms of money. <laughs> so I know how valuable you think he is. Well, he says he's worth a good deal. <coughs> how much is a good deal? So he says, well, he ain't for sale, as I told you. And I don't want to make no remarks that would mislead you. But if he was for sale, which he ain't, and I was to put a price upon him which I refused to do. I'd say he was no good to me at all unless he'd fetch, well, uh, let's say, oh, about, uh, oh, I'd say about a dollar and a quarter. <laughs> well, I said, I admire your honesty and I thank you for your opinion. 
But I can see that your sentimental attachment to him has given you some erroneous ideas. But if he was for sale, which I understand he ain't, <laughs> and if I was to be interested in, them, in buying them, which I ain't, I don't believe I could possibly bring myself to make an offer for him of anything above 75 cents. <laughs> so the fellow says, so. <laughs> well, I hauled out my wallet and I paid him and he got me a string and I tied it onto my new dog and we started out for the depot on the dead run because I could hear the train putting on the air already. As we run along, I watched the dog. He was certainly a likely looking as any I ever cracked my eye to. And I say it as one who's seen dogs more or less for all my life. He had a beagle's face. And I judged his nose was good. And his back was limber as a willow wire. And the way he picked up his feet and put them down was sweet as a heavenly chorus singing angels to <coughs> He had a swing to him, and I chuckled at what we had to store for the rabbits mm -hmm. up home at Winnie Pitlock. They'd got far loping along in front of one of our old dogs. Uh oh, all our old dogs. I planned to put them down and astonish them a great deal. I, I was admiring my dog so much, I almost forgot to pick up a copy of the Van Gogh Daily News, but I got one. And I found me a seat. And I sat down and tied the dog to the footrest. He sat up and I patted him some and I was proud of him. He had a dewy eye and a buckshot nose. <coughs> and every fiber of his carcass was laid just the right way. His ears hung good without too much thought. And every point was a hundred percent and some to spare. I had just said to myself, I do believe that's the fastest hound dog in the state of Maine without the shadow of a dog. But I looked up and the conductor was standing by my seat with the ticket punch in his hand. And he says, uh, what's that? What's what, I said. <coughs> that dog, he said, I said, presume it is a dog, is it not? <laughs> It is, I says, and furthermore, I says, he's the fastest hound dog in the state of Maine. <laughs> he is, he says. I says, yes, he is. How do you know, he says. I says, yes. I says, yes, he is. How do you know? He says, I says, by the looks of him, did you ever see a dog like him? No, he says, I never did. I says, see how high strung and limber he is. His hind legs is like a kangaroo. The way his front ones hang on the bias, he couldn't interfere if he had to. Mm -hmm. That's for speed. Notice his nose and his knowing eye, I says, and you can see for yourself. You don't look so fast to me, he says. He is, I says. Where'd you get him, he says. Right here in Matawong Cag, I says. He's red, I says, patting the dog. How is he bred, he says. Down the line, he says. His late mother was a beagle, as you can see. And for nose, you give me a beagle and I can be happy. Without a doubt, she had the longest pedigree papers ever registered. Although I said, I'm not going to hand myself to care. But the papers, if the breeding is good. That's right, he said. What was his father? His father, I says, was mostly a Matawong gang. That's where he gets his ranginess and high wheel confirmation. I see, I says, well, you can't take a dog in the coaches on the Van Gogh Aristocrat Railroad, so you've got to get him out of here. Well, except for a minute I was floored, as I had thought of that. But I says, well, I got to get this dog home to win a pitlock, and I got a ticket. And I don't see what harm he'll do sitting here at my feet. And where he's the fastest hound dog in the state of Maine, it seems as if we might stretch a point. The Van Gogh and Aristic Railroad, he says, don't stretch no points. <laughs> and the rule is no dogs in the coaches, and you've got to get him out of here. You can put him in a baggage car 
or leash and muzzle, he says. Well, there I says, now we're talking sense. Which way is the baggage car, I says, front or back? They ain't no baggage car on this train, he says. Then I says, I got rights and I plan to take my good dog home and we ain't gonna stay right <coughs> there. Oh, no, you ain't, he says. You gotta get him off the train and you gotta get him off quick because we're only an hour late now and we don't want to get any later. So I swear, says, with a sudden bright idea, I says, I tell you what I'll do then. I just tie my dog to the back platform of the last car. And while we run up to Winnipeg Dog, he can pop along behind the train and it'll give him a little exercise and won't break no rules of the railroad. So the conductor says, it might not break any rules of the railroad, but it sure would be a dirty trick on the dog. He'd get drunk to death the first mile. Well, I kind of hoisted my hand up, so I says, they ain't no train the Van Gogh and Arista Runs could drug that dog to death, mister, I says. I put real meaning in that mister. I says, that's the fastest hound dog in the state of Maine, and if you could run your trains half as well, you wouldn't be no hour late right now. <coughs> That kind of made him set up and take notice, and I could see it was a telling blow. I got up real mad and untied the string, and the dog and I walked back through the train with our heads held high and not taking any guff from anybody. All the way back, the conductor kept telling me I couldn't tie the dog on back, that he'd get rucked to death, and it was cruelty to dumb animals. This dog ain't so dumb, I said, but what are you going to find somebody dumber if he was to look? And I put the dog down on the tracks behind the train and let up the rope to give him free slack to play around with. And while I was doing it, the conductor said something about how he was willing to bet money the dog would never set eyes on when Pitlock. <laughs> money, I says, is a bond conversationalist, and I slapped my wallet. And I am always keen eared to hear it talk. That kind of stopped him for a minute. But he says, all right, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm a sporting man and I'll just make you a bet. I'll bet you 25 cents. That dog is dead when we get to win a pit road. Look, I says, I'm a sporting man myself and I don't mind so and so. And I just leave, well, I just leave, take your money as anybody's, but up to where the pitlock, where I come from, it's the same thing. The insult you mentioned, and it's a minimum amount of that. If you haul out your wallet and make a bet that's got some heat on its ribs, I'm with you and ready to do business. I didn't want him to think I lacked confidence in my dog. So he said, well, then, you say how much. He hauled out his wallet. So I said, well, it ought to be enough to make it interesting, and I don't think we should mention any sum that wouldn't make it worthwhile to the dog. So he says, how much then? So I said, well, what do you say, 50 cents? Mm -hmm. Done, he says. <laughs> so I finished tying on the dog, and we went back in the coach and got a run and a hold of the money. <laughs> While the conductor was going to take it up, Tickets. I, I sat down and commenced reading the Bangor Daily News and put the whole matter out of my mind. I chanced to look up after a while and I saw we was coming right along. I thought to myself that if we kept this up, I ought to get home at fair season. And just then the conductor come back and he braced himself against my seat and he said, we're going right along now. Seemed to be, I says. We made up 45 minutes, he said. <laughs> oh, that's good, I says. He said, how about the dog? What dog is that, I says. The one we tied on back, he says. He's probably dead by now. But I had confidence in that dog, so I says, no, I don't think so. But there's a good way to find out. So we went out back, and there was the dog, all right. He won't even breathe in hard, just sloping along at an easy gait, holding his head high and lifting the slack of the rope with his teeth so he wouldn't trip over it. 
<laughs> Mason had stepped stole up with ties come right. And I could see what the conductor was, I could see the conductor was really disappointed. So I tried to rub it in a little and I said, do you, do you want to pay me now? <laughs> no, sir, he says, I admit I expected him to be in worse case, but we could go a long way from what a bit long. <coughs> Your money will be riding on no sure thing. We still got that long downgrade by Mars Hill. And when we hit that, you'll see. Well, I tried to read the Van Gogh Daily News, but every time I'd get settled down, the conductor would come by and want to look at the dog. So we'd go back. And every time we did, he was coming along an easy clip, just, just giving his speed to the lay of the ties and not trying to gain any. And I can tell you, I can tell you that conductor was a mighty sick man, thinking how his 50 cents was as good as gone and nothing to show for it. But he kept saying, you just wait. When we get to that long downgrade by Mars Hill, he'll be drunk to death. <laughs> well, I was sitting with one foot up reading the Van Gogh Daily News. I turned the page and happened to look out the window. And I almost swallowed my teeth if I'd had them in. But the way the state of Maine was galloping by, we were hyper, just tearing. And I says to myself, that conductor has got the engineer in cahoots and they're piling on the steam just to get my 50 cents. And just then the conductor come by and he had a smile on his face and I could see he was pretty pleased at the way we was going. He says, this is that long downgrade by Mars Hill. I says, it is? Yes, sir, he says, and we're moving right along. <coughs> does, it does seem so, I says. Sir. Running 35 minutes ahead of schedule, he says. He says, oh, I says. We generally open things up along in here, he says. Well, I can see we're going right along, I says. He says, uh, how do you suppose he's making out? Who's that, I says. The dog, he says. Oh, I said, the dog. I said, I put it completely out of my mind. I'm glad you spoke of him. I said, he says, don't you think we'd better go back and look at him? No, I said, he's all right. You don't need to worry none about him. I don't think the Van Gogh and Rustic is likely to bother him much. I says, let's go look at him, he says. Well, we can if you want her, I says. But I doubt it's going to make you feel any better. To tell the truth, though, I had begun to mistrust things some, and I didn't like the way the train was hightailing it along. I do believe that's the fastest speed the Van Gogh and Hershey Railroad ever managed to get up to. <laughs> I couldn't, couldn't help thinking how much it was costing them in coal just to protect that 50 cents. And I got a feeling sorry for the fireman who took to all that trouble just to embarrass me of my new dog, but I wasn't going to get, let that conductor see I was fretting, so I makes believe I was finished a sentence in the paper, and I lays it down and I yawns and gets up. And when we got out on the back platform, you could have heard my heart go flunk down into my stomach, because there wasn't no dog there. <coughs> Pay me, shouts the conductor, and he laughs and carries on just as if 50 cents was the biggest thing in the world. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't wait to get home with it. Now wait a minute, I says, sparring for time. I says, you got too small an opinion of my dog. I told you the dog was fast. And you was, was too smart out to listen to, 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 to me. Now the, the, the truth is that this dog has just got tired poking along behind. And I think he's too fast for the band going to roost in my opinion, I says, he's just trotted up alongside the train to get out of the dust. I think if we look up the side of the train, we'll find him. You might as well pay, he says, that dog got drugged to death miles back, and you might as well pay. But I went over to the side of the platform and connected with me, and we was going so fast, I almost got my head snapped off when I stuck it out. But by holding our hands against the dust, we could see. And there weren't no dog there, either. And I was feeling 
pretty bad about it. Pay me, shouts the conductor, rubbing his hands. No, sir, I says, you forget, mister, that they have two sides to every train. And I got confidence in my dog, and I just took the wrong side of the train first. I'll admit you that the engineer cahooted up on me, and the dog had got speed too. He wanted to know that, and the band dog, or an aristocrat, don't know that dog as well as I do. Now, we'll just look up the other side of the train, and I think you'll find the dog is there. All right. So we went out, we held our hand against the wind, and if you ever see a sick conductor, that fellow was your man. <laughs> Because there was my dog, the fastest hound dog in the state of Maine, up alongside the train, running along easy like on three legs and wetting down a hot box. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.